Um, yes, yeah, so this meeting is, is being recorded and the recording will be posted on mass.gov or slash 2030 CECP website within a week. Um, please, we ask that you remain on mute during the presentation. There will be an opportunity after the presentation for questions and discussion. Uh, please reserve the chat box only for the logistics. Um, if you have any comments, um, please uh, email it to us instead so we can do the proper accounting. Um, if you have any questions, you could put it in the chat if you like, but um, uh, there's a better chance for you to get your questions answered if you line up in the queue towards the uh, end of the uh, meeting, sorry, at the end of the presentation. Lastly, if you haven't done so, um, please sign in by hovering over your name in the participants list and uh, click on rename. Um, so you make sure you can put your first name, the last name, and if you have an affiliation, please um, put that as well. And with that, I will turn it over to Beth Card, our Under Secretary of Environmental Policies and Climate Resilience to provide some welcome remarks under Secretary Card. Great, thank you so much, Han, and um, good afternoon and welcome everyone. It's so great to have such a large group um, joining us uh, and taking time out of all of your uh, busy days to uh, participate in our second meeting uh, in a series of public meetings to gather feedback on goals and strategies for our clean energy and climate plan for 2025 and 2030, uh, focusing on forest land. And so really on behalf of myself and Undersecretary Judy Chang, who's with us uh, as well today, uh, thank you and, and welcome you uh, to this session. Um, our first public meeting in the series uh, was held last month where we discussed the statutory requirements uh, and development process of the Clean Energy and Climate Plan 2025 and 2030, our approach to developing goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and enhancing carbon sequestration on natural and working lands. And we also uh, were able to gather feedback on the five broad strategies uh, that we have for achieving these goals. In today's meeting, we will focus on three of those broad strategies as they pertain to forest land, protect, manage, and restore. We are drawing upon a subset of proposed actions in the Resilient Lands Initiative to inform the Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2025 and 2030. Kurt Gartner, the Assistant Secretary of en Environmental Policy, will provide an overview of the Resilient Lands Initiative, as well as outline the proposed goals and actions for forest land. We will also have a short presentation on climate smart forestry from Todd Antel, the Climate Adaptation Specialist and Research Scientist at the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. Following, following Dr. Antel's presentation, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, uh, some of our folks there, will provide a brief overview of their planning efforts on state forest and parklands. The second half of this meeting is an opportunity for us to hear from all of you and to answer any questions that you may have on what was presented today. Um, and we very much look forward to hearing from you um, and getting your feedback. Uh, to help guide our efforts and progress going forward. So um, with that, I wanna thank you again for being here and for your time. And I will uh, turn it over to Kurt Gartner to kick off the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Undersecretary. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as was just mentioned, uh, this is the overview of uh, what we're gonna talk about during uh, particularly the presentation session of today's meeting and then uh, we are looking for the second part to be uh, a feedback question and answer really discussion session for your uh, feedback, your understanding, uh, and your contributions to uh, natural and working lands and the policies that we will include in the clean energy and climate plan. Uh, I'm going to start with the resilient lands initiative, talk about uh, not only the objective goals and process that were associated with that, but particularly focus on the protect, manage, and restore actions included in it. Um, Todd is going to talk about climate smart forestry. Uh, Jessica and Pete from the uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation are going to talk about park and forest planning. And then we're going to spend the remainder of the meeting on uh, your input. So the Resilient Lands Initiative. I uh, want to start by, with a quick refresher uh, for uh, all of you and all of, and, uh, all of us on 
uh, some of the background material that gets to uh, the natural and working lands aspects of the Clean Energy and Climate Plan. First, uh, deadlines. Uh, the Clean Energy and Climate Plan 25 and uh, 2030 version needs to be completed uh, this July. As a reminder, greenhouse gas emissions, we need are required to reduce them 50% below 1990 levels and to achieve net zero in 2050. That is what the work we're gonna talk about is aiming toward. In terms of natural and working lands, the, uh, the uh, objectives, uh, the requirements of the natural and working lands plan are outlined here on this slide. Uh, first, uh, that we will be producing a statewide baseline measurement and measuring carbon flux on natural and working lands. Second, establishing, adopting statewide goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase sequestration on natural and working lands. As part of that, setting numerical benchmarks and tracking the release of greenhouse gases and uh, products derived from natural and working lands. And then the uh, statute sets out the objectives for the plan and the content of the plan. The last longer bullet here uh, gets to those requirements. We would emphasize three things here. First, in the second line, you'll see that it says land protection, management, and restoration. Today's conversation is gonna focus on those three things in the context of forests. Also, you'll notice is, uh, toward the end of this paragraph that it speaks to public process and public consultation. That is uh, the stakeholder process. The meeting today is part of the stakeholder process that will go into the Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2025 and 2030. So, uh, the Natural and Working Lands Plan will focus in sort of priority order on protection of natural and working lands to protect current stored carbon on management of those natural and working lands, uh, means by which we might uh, enhance or at least secure the resiliency of that carbon storage. Third, restoring lands where uh, there's the opportunity for additional carbon storage, perhaps already developed lands that we might be able to uh, restore forests to. And then not the subject of today's conversation, but other aspects of what will be in the natural and working lands plan will be uh, carbon storage and durable wood products and uh, other means of additional carbon sequestration. And I thought uh, it would be useful to include uh, the statutory definition of natural and working lands, uh, which you will see here on the bottom of this slide. Notice that it includes parks and urban and community forests in addition to uh, what we might assume as natural and working lands. So it's a, it's a broad definition and one that is important as we get into the context of the Resilient Lands Initiative. The Natural and Working Lands Plan is going to be informed by quite a number of documents and conversations. The presentation I'm gonna give, uh, you'll see outlined in red there is on the Natural Resilient Lands Initiative and Natural and Working Lands concept in there as pertains to forests. But there's lots of other input to the Clean Energy and Climate Plan, the kind of stakeholder input we're going to be uh, gathering from you today and in your written comments, and the kind of policies and programs, information, guidance found in the other documents referenced on this page. Uh, and we really do uh, appreciate your comments, the stakeholder input, and uh, want you to know that we are going to be drawing on documents like the Resilient Lands Initiative and the policies uh, they're included in there as uh, we are considering what to include in the clean energy and climate plan. So uh, I am not assuming that uh, all of you are familiar with the Resilient Lands Initiative, so I wanted to provide a quick summary uh, of what uh, the document is, what the goals and process were around this plan. So first of all, it is intended to be an inclusive vision for land conservation and stewardship, uh, that's important too. So it's about what we protect going forward on the landscape and how we care for what we have already protected. Second, uh, it is intended to provide a compelling, we hope so, case for land conservation uh, as uh, a means of both helping uh, people and the natural resources of, com of the Commonwealth and a means to reduce and prepare for climate change. Climate change was a prominent consideration uh, as we worked toward the um, natural and working lands aspects and the Resilient Lands Initiative. It was also intended to be relevant to other efforts. We knew 
uh, as the Resilient Labs Initiative was being uh, developed that the Clean Energy and Climate Plan was running on a parallel track. And so the recommendations in here were very much intended to inform the uh, Clean Energy and Climate Plan. Uh, I wanted to feature some of the proposed goals that are included in the, in the plan as uh, that are particularly relevant to today. First of all, a desire to achieve no net loss, uh, meaning that we, if we are, we want to reduce as much as we can farms and forests, forests being a part of today's conversation, that are lost to development. We know we're not going to eliminate them entirely, but we believe we can reduce them and that there are means of offsetting loss of forest land through reforestation. The goal uh, reduce the footprint of development uh, by 15,000 acres and provide new canopy cover. Another goal that's spoken of in the Resilient Lands Initiative is to conserve our largest remaining intact landscapes and uh, to seek to achieve a 30% land conservation objective by 2030. And, and I, the objective of helping to achieve the uh, carbon sequestration that we need to achieve net zero. We're going to work very hard in the building sector and the transportation sector to reduce those emissions but we know that sequestration is going to be important to realizing net zero and the Resilient Lands Initiative was formulated with that in mind. The process involved uh, a focus group met uh, about four, uh, a steering committee rather, met a dozen times, had 40 plus members, it involved uh, 14 different focus uh, group meetings on specific topics and two open meeting uh, meetings like this one to date, and uh, the document is available. I've included the link there uh, for people to look at the uh, Resilient Lands Initiative that's available on EEA's website. The plan addresses nine different land values. Land is important for uh, many different purposes, and we organize the plan to address these nine values. Today, we're gonna to talk principally about a couple of them. For example, number two there, reducing climate impacts to people will be in our conversation today. And then in terms of addressing those values, there needed to be actions. Uh, we, uh, and policies, programs, means of addressing those land values and achieving the kinds of objectives we were looking for. We called those actions and we grouped them into strategies. And today we're gonna to talk about just a couple of them. Uh, and so while there are eight of them today, we're gonna to talk about the first one, uh, no net loss. We're trying to reduce loss of forest and farmland uh, as much as we can, realizing that we still do need to achieve our housing and other objectives while we are doing so. Uh, and that we uh, will need to offset if we are to achieve no net loss by 2030, uh, development on uh, forested land. That's why there is reference in this slide to canopy cover and restoration of those lands. Also, uh, actions within the Resilient Lands Initiative, there are a number of them that cannot be accomplished without legislation. Uh, and there is reference in the Resilient Lands Initiative to uh, what's called a Lands for the People Bill going forward. There'll be need for a public process, conversation, engagement, dialogue around uh, which strategies in the Resilient Lands Initiative ought to be picked, which actions are appropriate, and uh, which ones the, uh, the administration and others can support uh, as part of implementation of the Resilient Lands Initiative. The, uh, the initiative is and the actions are a menu. Uh, we knew at the, out, at the outset when we worked on the plan that not all of these uh, would be appropriate, not all of them would be pursued. It's done in a menu approach, and this would be a way of getting at the um, strategies and actions that require legislation. Key proposed actions, one has to do with smart growth, second has to do with uh, use of pilot payments, alternatives to pilot payments, and a third tree planting along rivers. The point of including these is that there are metrics for what can be accomplished if these strategies are chosen from the menu of options. The second section we wanna focus on for today is uh, carbon storage and climate resilience. Obviously the central one for today. And I've listed a few of the proposed actions here, principally so that you see the metrics associated. 
if these items are chosen, if they're implemented as part of the Resilient Lands Initiative and the Clean Energy and Climate Plan, we think these are the types of benefits we might see from them. Uh, for example, uh, 100,000 acres of forest managed to enhance uh, carbon uh, and resilience, something that Todd will be talking about later in the presentation. So we mentioned a hierarchy, uh, starting with protection. And in the context of forests, this is a particularly important one. That's why it's first in our hierarchy. We are, of course, uh, among the most forested and most dens densely populated states. This graphic illustrates that point, how we address forests, how we protect forests and reduce loss of forest cover is therefore particularly important. I include some information from the climate roadmap produced as part of our research efforts to try and illustrate why this is such an important uh, question for us, picking the right strategies, why it matters. The second bullet here, I think really brings us home. Our projections under a variety of scenarios were, are for forest loss affecting 112,000 to 143,000 acres under, under all of those scenarios, absent the pursuit of some of the uh, strategies included in the Resilient Lands Initiative and potentially the Clean Energy and Climate Plan. So that means that those forested lands would not be available for carbon sequestration and that existing carbon on those lands would be lost over the course of their uh, development. It just drives home for me the importance of talking about uh, protection first. At the bottom of this slide, you see a summary of research from Clark University that looks backward at land consumption, land use, and basically also illustrates that it is a significant issue that land is being converted. It sort of looks back and confirms this forward looking scenario uh, on the importance of avoiding conversion. I did, however, uh, think it was important to mention the uh, benefits of what we already do. We are starting with a solid foundation here in Massachusetts. Uh, we do already invest in land conservation in ways other states, other places do not. So we have a 35 million a year or so investment in land acquisition and parks creation and the like. It is something that we can build on. We have structured state investment policies in ways that help to uh, reduce land consumption. We've uh, been working at that for some time. Uh, we offer existing incentives for municipal uh, land use regulations that might be helpful with land consumption. Uh, land use planning grants, for example. And we have existing landowner incentives that I'm sure many of you are familiar with in the form of uh, the various chapter 61 uh, aspects and most notably 61 itself for, for forestry. So we have a foundation to build on. And as we get into the comment and conversation side of today's agenda, some potential enhancements uh, for your consideration for input uh, one strategy would be to say, great that you spend, uh, say, 35 million. What if we spent more on uh, land conservation, either direct purchases by agencies, grants to communities and land trusts uh, in the form of an expanded tax credit, perhaps? So one thing we can do to protect is to protect. Uh, we could also, you could also tell us, well, uh, that's, I don't think you're spending your money as effectively as you could. What if you Instead of spending money uh, so much on uh, grants to communities and land trusts, we spend about 20 million a year on that. Uh, I think it'd be more effective spending money on direct purchases by agencies, where we spend about 11 million. Uh, you could also uh, tell us we uh, you should look at land use and other regulations and focus on that as a way of doing this. Uh, point is, I'm going to go now through the. Uh, protection related aspects of the Resilient Lands Initiative. I have selected some of them I thought would be most useful to conversation to uh, your input and uh, just wanna go through them very quickly. So first, we wanna encourage better regulatory practices on the part of cities and towns. One strategy would be to encourage enhanced adoption of zoning that protects farm and forest land. We could also encourage and would welcome greater acceptance and use of tree protection bylaws. Uh, those that would make sure that as a site is developed for a, a housing or other use, that trees are retained to the extent that it's possible. 
Another strategy that's mentioned here, one that does reflect the more frequent and intense storms associated with climate change, is to ask questions about whether it would be appropriate to better protect the upland areas of watersheds uh, as both a land protection strategy and as a water supply uh, and climate resilience strategy. The plan also uh, suggests maybe a pilot for climate payment might be an appropriate way to encourage uh, more protection of land. Pilot being payment in lieu of taxes. And the suggestion here is, well, communities that have large amounts of land conserved, particularly small and rural communities, how about something that enables them to uh, benefit from the uh, service that they are doing the Commonwealth and the planet as a whole through funding that they could further invest in green uh, infrastructure and other activities. Lastly, I would mention that the uh, Agricultural Preservation Restriction Program is mentioned, and in particular, the uh, possibility of expanding to whole farms. That is a, an alternative to the existing APR approach and could offer some benefits to protecting uh, land in the context of climate change. At the bottom of this slide and several coming slides is a repeated uh, set of numbers. All of those just are our estimates included in the Resilient Lands Initiative of potential benefits from implementation of these sorts of policies. Uh, it gives context for what might uh, be possible through uh, 2030. Other protect related actions in the Resilient Lands Initiative, it encourages us to adopt a greater approach on landscape scale conservation, meaning big blocks of un a presently unprotected open space, particularly those that serve as water supplies to some of the larger communities in the Commonwealth. Uh, the folks who advised us on the Resilient Lands Initiative think there's good opportunity for uh, land conservation in that context and that that would serve our climate goals. Next, uh, there was a recommendation to create the forest, a forest viability program. Folks may be familiar with the existing farm viability program. The idea here would be to provide funding to uh, forest related businesses with the understanding that or the requirement, not just the understanding that they preserve their land for a period of time, uh, making those, uh, keeping those lands as forests and making them more valuable uh, in, in terms of forest products. Finally, uh, moving on to manage, I should say, uh, there were a couple I wanted to cite here in the manage category. This uh, subject today is gonna principally be covered by Todd in a few minutes but there were two I wanted to bring to the forefront for your consideration. First, the Resilient Lands Initiative suggests launching a forest resilience program, essentially providing incentive to forest uh, landowners, private landowners, uh, or possibly municipal to uh, adopt climate smart forestry practices, the sorts of things that Todd is going to be talking about. And, one of the questions we would have for you is, is this a, a strategy you could see as an effective way of pursuing uh, our climate goals? And if so, how would you structure the type of incentive uh, that would encourage a private landowner to manage their property with carbon in mind? And finally, in the managed category, amending the forest conservation tax law. There's been, we uh, mentioned earlier, chapter 61. There's been conversation around a chapter 61C for climate and carbon. Again, offering a tax incentive for municipal, I'm sorry, for private property owners to uh, manage their forests or possibly their crop lands for uh, carbon benefit. And then in terms of restore, the uh, Resilient Lands Initiative, unlike past land conservation plans, uh, does heavily look at previously developed places and what might be done to restore places where we have not frankly done a great job of protecting natural resource values, places where uh, the environment is degraded, it speaks to the possibility of designating administratively a climate risk zone, a place where there's perhaps a combination of opportunity for restoration related activities and that might be places uh, characterized by environmental justice populations strategies. In addition to our existing Gateway City Tree Program talks about tax credits for tree planting. Maybe that would be a good strategy for us to pursue. 
We are already working on uh, programs to uh, enhance, we don't really uh, aggressively plant now, riparian buffers along rivers, streams, lakes, and ponds. We think that uh, was something that would offer benefits for not just climate, but other reasons and something that uh, could be pursued. And then the plan also includes a, a lot of strategies, options for greening developed areas, principally urban places with vacant underutilized lots, uh, or perhaps parking lots, looking at the last bullet in this section. We uh, think there's opportunity here and would welcome input on the right way to select and to utilize natural and working land strategies to green uh, developed areas. And again, you can see the first bullet there, we think there's potential for up to 6,000 acres of this type of greening through 2030 if we were to pursue some or uh, all of these strategies. So having provided context from the Resilient Lands Initiative uh, for conversation in our second half of today's meeting, we now uh, are pleased uh, to be joined by, by Todd Ontel, as it says on here, uh, Climate Adaptation Specialist from the Northeast Institute of Compl Applied Climate Science. Uh, Todd has worked uh, with uh, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, with some of our other partners, um, the, uh, the Nature Conservancy and others on forestry related techniques, has been part of our advisory team on climate smart forestry, and. Uh, we're pleased uh, that he is uh, able and willing to talk to us today uh, about climate smart forestry. Uh, let me turn it over to Todd. Thank you, Kurt. Um, since you're sharing this, your screen, should I just indicate a uh, slide advancement to you or do you want me to take Yes, control? I'm happy to do that. Okay, great, thank you. Well, well thanks for that introduction, Kurt, Ann, and uh, thank you all uh, for joining us this afternoon. I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to, to speak with you briefly on climate smart forestry. I'm going to describe uh, the science that really is the foundation for, for climate smart forestry, um, hopefully along the, the way addressing uh, many common questions about carbon management and really link these to examples of actions that landowners and land managers can take to enhance climate mitigation uh, for the Commonwealth's forests. And I do want to point out that um, this work, the science, um, and the translation of that science into potential actions um, is really the effort of many, many partners working in Massachusetts as well as throughout the New England region. Um, and so hopefully I represent that, uh, that collective effort here. Okay, uh, go to the next slide. So for us, you know, we recognize for us really for their their climate mitigation capacity. So here's some just some some brief uh, uh, numbers for us offset up to 15% of US emissions from burning fossil fuels that changes kind of depending upon the year. Um, uh, they also represent over two thirds of the carbon stored in terrestrial ecosystems. And forests represent a whopping 90% of the land sector's capacity to sequester additional carbon. So, you know, to address the climate crisis, we not only need to maintain this mitigation capacity, but we also are looking for ways that we can be working towards enhancing it as well. Next slide. So climate smart forestry is a term that generally describes forestry practices that both improve the resilience of forests to climate change impacts as well as increasing uh, the carbon benefits that we derive from forests uh, in terms of both carbon storage and carbon sequestration. So these terms storage and sequestration are sometimes used interchangeably, but they actually mean very specific and different things. So storage is what we refer to as the amount of carbon that's retained within a particular pool in a forest. And I'll describe that in a minute. And then sequestration is really uh, what we call a flux. It's a process. It's, it's the ability of plants to pull carbon from the atmosphere in the form of CO2 and then um, uh, create biomass um, that's used uh, both in the maintenance and growth of plants. Next slide. So this kind of gets to that first FAQ uh, that I often hear people ask, you know, whether or not carbon goals should focus on 
storage or on sequestration, because this has important implications for the type of forest management that one would take. For example, older forests typically have high carbon storage from the abundant biomass that's found in the large trees. Uh, but on average, these older forests have lower carbon sequestration rates as, as growth rates on a per acre basis begin to slow down. Um, Definitely that compared to younger forests where you know, uh, there's abundant young trees that are growing vertically, but these trees are small and so there's less biomass and so lower carbon storage. So you can see that there's kind of a, a trade-off here, right, right from the get-go. Uh, next slide. So the answer to that question really is both, um, particularly as it pertains to kind of broad scale planning efforts like we're, we're thinking about here uh, with the clean energy and climate plan, uh, that answer might be a little more complex or different for an individual landowner who's managing just a single stand. Um, but when we're thinking about you know, uh, the state of Massachusetts and, and planning for our mitigation capacity here, you know, we can really think of this as a win-win where we can manage across these landscapes, managing for diversity of age classes, both young and old forests, a diversity of forest types, uh, such as forests dominated by both early successional species as well as late section, successional species. Um, and by doing so, we can have um, you know, kind of a balance between you know, both sequestration and, and storage and not putting such an emphasis on one or the other. And, and importantly, this balance is very important for maintaining resilience of our forests as well. Next slide. Okay, so another common question relates to really just understanding where carbon is found in our forest and, and how much carbon is there. So carbon is typically categorized into uh, what are called pools, so types of, of carbon. Um, and I'm showing on the left there uh, five pools that we often think about carbon residing in the live above ground biomass, which is often the, the largest as well as the most visible carbon pool. So the carbon that's in trees and, and vegetation. <clears throat> the live below ground is a much smaller pool typically around 10% and really represents the, the roots of, of vegetation. Uh, dead wood such as logs, stumps, large branches and standing dead trees are another uh, pool that we can, uh, is very visible, um, but also kind of a, a typically a smaller percentage. Um, the forest floor um, is uh, represented by kind of the litter layer, leaves, small branches, and it is another uh, small pool, typically one of the smallest carbon pools. <clears throat> Oftentimes, many people don't recognize that soils can be one of the largest, if not the largest, carbon pool, depending upon the soil type. In our example, we're looking at oak, a typical oak hickory forest. Um, this is data from Forest Service FIA um, showing about a, less than a third of the carbon is in soils, but in some other forest and types like, like uh, spruce fir forest, that can be up to half of the carbon in the forest. Next slide. So the total amount of carbon um, and, and the proportion of carbon in these different pools can vary depending upon a number of really critical factors, some of which I'm showing here, but this is not, uh, certainly not all of them. Some, some important factors that I've already mentioned are uh, the, the age of the forest or the, the stand age. Uh, you can see in this growth curve on the left, which is a representative of a maple beech birch forest in, in the Northeast, that really fast growth rate of those young stands and the high storage of those older stands uh, kind of on the left portion or, or the right portion of that, that figure. <clears throat> um, and you'll notice that as forests reach kind of about 100 to 150 years old, which is where a lot of our forests in, in New England are currently, they, they essentially stop gaining uh, as much carbon as they were when they were younger. So they are storing a lot of carbon, but not really sequestering as much new carbon. 
Um, disturbance, both in the form of natural disturbances like wind throw, but also harvest disturbances can really impact carbon stocks as well as impacting sequestration rates. And this is a, a photo from uh, a windstorm that impacted the Hubbard, Hubbard Brook uh, back in 2013. Another important factor is the structure of forest stands. Uh, a more structurally diverse stand that has a variety of tree sizes and, and ages shown on the top, um, which can be often described as an uneven aged condition, typically can pack more carbon into the same footprint as a similar but more structurally simplified stand, which is represented in the bottom cartoon. Um, because there is a mix of tree ages in that more structurally complex stand, they can also typically sustain higher sequestration rates as well. So overall, a more structurally complex forest, the greater the carbon benefit that we can derive from it. Uh, some of the other factors also include the forest type, species composition, those sorts of things. So at this, uh, maybe you can go ahead to that next slide, thanks. So at this point, I can imagine many people are, are starting to wonder what climate smart forestry looks like. What, do, what can we do? Next slide. Well, the simple, uh, the best simple answer I can provide at this point is really that it depends. As Kurt already mentioned, um, there really needs to be kind of a menu approach uh, to, to this sort of thinking um, and, and tailoring the particular approach to what's appropriate for any given forest. Uh, recognizing every forest is different and those differences really determine what the most effective action will look like. Um, that might be based on site condition, what the climate vulnerabilities are for that particular forest, what a landowner's goals, as well as the resources they have available to them look like, uh, as well as what, what's the time frame that we're looking for? Do we, do we really need to derive as much uh, um, benefit in the near term, or can we look further out uh, for, for, for longer term benefits as well? And I'll explain this in more detail, um, but it's really important. I wanna emphasize that last point of addressing climate risks and vulnerabilities. Next slide. Okay. Uh, well, my apologies, the slide seemed stuck and I'm, oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, so this answer, this it depends answer of course, leaves a lot of people wondering, well, how am I able to then plan for increasing resilience and increasing carbon on, on my forest? How can we be planning uh, at, at, at the scale of, of the state? Key aspect of climate smart forestry is that we are looking at those site conditions, both for the opportunities to enhance carbon, but also um, <clears throat> to be effective, we need at increasing carbon, we need our plans to address the risks of losing the carbon that we already have. So really a balance between opportunities to gain carbon, but making sure we're not losing carbon. Next slide. And so what the science indicates uh, is that these risks can often be understood uh, by looking at the past land use and how that's shaped our our current forests by looking at the existing stressors that are impacting our forest ability to, to grow and regenerate and looking to the future uh, to understand future climate conditions uh, and, and what might make our forests vulnerable uh, under future climate. But the science also indicates uh, how management actions that we can take can reduce those risks and create forests that are more resilient to disturbance and more adapted to future conditions, which ultimately will create a more robust and resilient carbon sink in our forests. Next slide. So looking to the past, many of the forests in New England uh, and, and indeed Massachusetts have regrown following agricultural abandonment as this figure from a Harvard Forest Woodlands and Wildlands report shows uh, on the left. I've highlighted those changes in forest cover in Massachusetts in that bold yellow line. Um, and we can see a dramatic increase in forest 
recover from the late 19th century, kind of peaking in the late 20th century. This is great. This means that our forests, um, you know, have created a, a strong carbon sink as they've regrown. Um, but you can also kind of surmise that, that we're kind of reaching that 100 to 150 year age in, in a lot of those forests. But an important point is that as those forests regrow, have regrown, they're not like the original forests that we once had. They're often more homogenous with less species diversity, um, more simplified stand structure, often even aged and typically lacking in some of those important carbon pools such as dead wood. And this creates both opportunities for carbon enhancement as well as some risks for carbon losses. Okay, next slide. So what are some actions that we can take to address these risks and also take advantage of those opportunities? Uh, well, uh, things like we can do things like altering uh, composition and enhancing species diversity through either creating gaps or enrichment planting in understocked forest stands. Treatments such as structural complexity enhancement uh, can add carbon to dead wood pools, as well as enhancing tree growth compared to uh, kind of conventional forest management approaches, all while not reducing total carbon compared to forests where uh, no treatments or cutting have occurred. Uh, so, so these are a couple of examples of ways that we can sort of address that simplified or homogenized uh, uh, forest structure. Next slide. Similarly, many of our forests in New England have significant forest health concerns. Uh, probably the, the biggest uh, concern might be due to insect pests, which recent analyses have shown that overall in, in the US, about 40% of our carbon in our forests are at risk to future loss from the top 15 uh, insect pests. Uh, additionally, New England is a hotspot for forest invasive plant species. Um, there are a, a number of these species of concern. I'm showing in the top photo there, a uh, honeysuckle shrub can reduce uh, uh, tree regeneration through that thick uh, cover. And on the bottom set of pictures, I'm showing uh, vines such as oriental bittersweet. Uh, 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 that is shown on the, on the right-hand picture in that bottom set of pictures, which can really reduce growth or even kill the mature canopy trees. Um, the picture on the, on the left shows a, uh, uh, a healthy canopy tree. And so addressing these sorts of risks are particularly important. Um, also herbivory from deer or moose have significantly reduced tree regeneration in many areas. And of course, fragmentation in our forests has turned up the dial on many of these forest health issues. Next slide. So uh, some climate smart actions to address these risks include increasing the resistance of forest stand to those invasive insect pests, such as hemlock woolly adelgid or uh, southern pine beetle in some of our pitch pine communities. Um, so thin, dense stands has been shown to enhance the resistance to these pests, which means, you know, there might be a slight loss in carbon uh, by doing some thinning, but the remaining trees are able to continue to grow and sequester additional carbon. There's some other no regrets actions to address other forest health issues, such as preventing establishment of invasive plants or removing existing invasions uh, or using fencing or other means to protect our forest regeneration from herbivory. Next slide. Uh, and finally, looking at how our climate is changing and how our forests are vulnerable to impacts to climate change is key to planning for climate smart forestry. Uh, impacts, uh, there's, there's a whole host of impacts from you know, more frequent and intense drought, wildfire risk, extreme rainfall, increasing frequency of other forest disturbances like wind storms, and ice storms. Um, and of course, there is a whole host of impacts associated with warming temperatures, especially uh, uh, warming winters that include uh, reduced snowpack, increased freeze thaw cycles, altered hydrology, and, and that northward expansion of those insect pests from warming winters that all threaten 
the carbon in our forests. Next slide. So many of the actions I've already described in the previous slide can reduce ri risks from those climate impacts. There's a few other that I'd like to mention that are critically important. Um, ways that we can uh, uh, reduce climate risks. Um, so one of those is either establishing future adapted tree species or, um, or enhancing or creating conditions for future adapted tree species. So that could look like you know, planting trees or just creating conditions that favor sort of the, the future adapted species that are already present in our forest. So kind of shifting species composition towards those uh, tree species that we expect to do better in the future. Also considering where our forest soils are most vulnerable and reducing the impacts through either comp compaction or erosion, using things like timber mats or temporary bridges at stream crossings, um, enhancing buffers around sensitive areas like riparian zones and wetlands are, are, are critical. Next slide. Uh, a new resource that has come out um, that I was fortunate enough to work on um, with some of uh, my, my Nature Conservancy colleagues, Laura Marks in, in Massachusetts and Chris Zimmerman in New York, um, addresses a suite of and describes a suite of climate smart forestry practices we're showing here. And um, importantly, this resource kind of describes how these practices contribute both to carbon, climate, adaptation as well as wildlife benefits. And importantly, outlines the forest conditions where these practices are expected to be most effective. Here I'm showing a thinning practice, which is a really important climate smart forestry practice. Not only does it enhance resilience to insect pests, which I've already described, but it can also uh, enhance resilience to drought, can increase the growth of the remaining trees. And so here in this event, uh, we describe how this practice is a modified approach of a typical thinning practice that's designed to leave the largest trees to maintain species diversity, which is an important resilience uh, component, and you know contribute to deadwood pools and forests. So really checking all of those boxes of effective climate smart forestry. Next slide. So lastly, I wanna leave you with a question or address a question, I guess, that I expect, always expect to hear on this topic, which is that given forests importance to climate mitigation, shouldn't we really just be protecting all of our forests? Next slide. The answer is a resounding yes. Uh, forest protection is one of those items on the menu that we need to be looking at for uh, climate smart forestry, but with the important caveat that it's not a one size fits all approach. Forest protection is important where it's appropriate and expected to be effective. And hopefully I, today I've provided enough information to highlight that where forest health issues exist, where climate vulnerability and other site conditions threaten our ability to maintain and enhance carbon, there's a critical role for active forest management. The science and our past experience is clear that not doing anything means that under these conditions, many of our forests are indeed at risk from changing from a carbon sink to a carbon source, which is exactly the opposite of what we need to do to address the, the climate crisis that's at hand. Uh, last slide. So I just want to, to put up here that there's a number of, of and resources. We can um, provide these slides. If folks want to see them, we can drop links into the chat. Um, but just to, to highlight that there's a number of great resources out there that describe a lot of this work. Um, resources from, uh, from UMass Amherst that address carbon and resiliency. Um, resources from the DCR that describes a lot of what I've talked about here. And then some resources we produced at NIACS. So thank you for, for your time and attention. I'll turn right. it back over to Kurt. Great, thank you, Todd. Uh, first of all, uh, Glenn Ayers and Michael Tashara, I see both of your hands. I'm gonna take your questions first in just a minute. We have one more brief presentation uh, and then we'll get to your questions and comments and uh, spend basically the last hour talking through uh, all sorts of, of uh, 
your comments and concerns. Um, but uh, first, we want to turn this over to uh, both Pete Church and Jessica Rokoff, uh, Director of Forest Stewardship and a planner uh, with DCR, respectively, who are going to talk a bit about uh, DCR's uh, state and forest planning efforts. And uh, that is something that folks who participated last month will recall uh, coming up and that we wanted to speak to briefly. So Pete and Jessica. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jessica Rowcroft. Um, I wanted to provide a little bit of an overview of some of the state park and forest planning efforts we've done in the past with regards to forestry. And then I'm going to hand it over to Pete, who's going to step in and tell you a little bit about where we're going this year. So for a little bit of a background, I know some of you were active participants in the Forest Futures visioning process. This was an effort that DCR undertook in 2009-2010 after some critiques of some of our uh, forestry practices, as well as a recognition by the agency and the DCR Stewardship Council the need to really engage our stakeholders a little bit more broadly in some of our land management practices. The um, Stewardship Council uh, identified a technical stewardship, uh, technical steering committee and an associated group, uh, sorry, advisory group of stakeholders to participate in a year-long public planning, public planning process to develop a framework for the agency to actually develop some of their forestry land management guidelines. This initial, initial visioning process uh, did involve, as you see, five public forums and had a number of recommendations that the agency then acted upon. One of them was establishing a position of director of forest stewardship, which Pete Church was then hired for and is still with us and uh, also clarifying some of our activities on DCR lands. The outcome of that was another multi-year effort involving the establishment of some forestry management guidelines, as well as what we ended up calling landscape designations. This was actually setting aside a set number of uh, acreage goals that were identified by the technical steering committee to establish land uh, designations that broke the DCR system into areas that were parklands, uh, identified high use recreation areas or areas that were developing, developed where forestry was not an appropriate activity, areas that were identified as reserves, large scale contigu contiguous woodlands, where we were going to actually not do any commercial harvesting and just maintain for passive recreation, as well as areas that were woodlands, areas that were appropriate for more active forestry land management efforts. This uh, long, the public planning process was very extensive and involved 14 different public meetings throughout the state. The first seven involved a review of some selection criteria that were drafted for these different landscape designations, as well as some draft management guidelines. Public input was factored in, and applied the selection criteria applied along with a very extensive GIS effort that did involve the coordination of um, multiple, uh, multiple outside stakeholders and partners that provided some input into this effort, including the uh, Division of, uh, I'm sorry, Department of Fish and Game, as well as Nature Conservancy and Natural Heritage and uh, dividing our land into ecological land units so that we could make sure we were peppering these different designations throughout the different eco ecosystems throughout the state. We then presented these back to the public in another series of seven public meetings and factored that input in to our final landscape designation, um, designations and our management guidelines which were then adopted by the DCR Stewardship Council in March of 2012. In those management guidelines, we did recognize the need to review these guidelines periodically and update them to reflect evolving data, um, I'm sorry, evolving new data, evolving concerns, <laughs> and um, be able to, to adjust these management guidelines and tweak them based upon our experience actually applying them in the field. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Pete. He can talk about some next steps. 
Great. Um, thank you, Jessica. Um, my internet has been um, acting up on me a little bit. Uh, can everyone hear me? Um, Kurt, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Excellent. Um, so um, Peter Church, Director of Forest Stewardship for DCR. And um, as Jessica mentioned, um, as recommended in the Forest Future Visioning, DCR manages its state parks and forests for a suite of ecosystem services. Um, and I mentioned state parks and forests um, does not include water supply, although um, most of these ecosystem services they manage for as well. Um, since 2012, since uh, the landscape designation um, process was completed, these are some of the ecosystem benefits that we've been managing for um, on our properties. Um, demonstration forestry. Um, we want to be leaders in exemplary forest management. Uh, restoration of native ecosystems and wildlife habitat. We've been doing that in, in areas in the, on our properties. Managing for carbon. Um, diversifying our species and stand structure. Home fuel wood hazard tree removal and recreation access improvements, uh, restoring fuel breaks in fire prone areas like in Miles Standish State Forest, increasing forest resilience for forest pest threats. Um, we mentioned emerald ash borer here, uh, but there are others that have been coming into the state. And then producing forest products and providing forest products payments to municipalities. Next slide. So um, in 2012, we said we'd be reviewing our landscape designations, management guidelines, and designations um, every 10 years. Um, we've assembled a working group, and we are starting um, our meetings um, um, later on in this month. Um, as we did in 2012, this working group will review our management guidelines and the designations, we'll assess how they're working in practice. We'll look at new data um, that's come to light and we will look at other recent um, complementary planning efforts like our state forest action plan that we just completed in 2020 and we'll identify areas for adjustment. We'll also look at new acquisitions that we've made since 2012 um, and um, formalize those into our designations. Um, we envision in the spring, we'll be having public forums to um, lay out the update, talk about um, where we're at, what's been working, what hasn't been working, and get public feedback. And then once we do that, we'll be making adjustments and updates, um, both internally and through the public feedback over the course of the summer and into the fall. So that's um, a quick um, update of where we're at with landscape designations. And I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Kurt. All right, folks, uh, that uh, took you about exactly what we were thinking it might. Uh, we wanna reserve we, uh, the second half of the meeting for bulk of our time for uh, conversation. And what we're looking for now uh, is uh, constructive feedback, suggestions, comments on uh, the natural and working lands uh, information that was presented, and uh, particularly with an eye toward what we might do uh, in the clean energy and climate plan, what policies might be appropriate for uh, for that purpose. And I have included a couple, uh, what six, five or six different feedback questions to sort of help us get started on this conversation. And so what I'm going to be doing is going. Uh, through and calling on folks. I see that, as I mentioned, Glenn and Michael have already raised their hands. I'll call on them first, and then we will go through and uh, take your questions and comments. Uh, as was mentioned at the outset, there's also opportunity to provide these in writing. And uh, I will uh, go ahead, I guess, and invite uh, Glenn to, uh, who had his hand up first, to offer some thoughts. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much. Oh. And. Okay, and, great. Yes, great. And um, I, I appreciated the presentation. I'd like to look at the slides because it, it was you went through it pretty fast. <laughs> so um, my, my first question is really, there's two policy issues or two policy matters that I think could have been adopted immediately after the passage of the next generation roadmap bill, which it's now almost a year since that was passed. 
And the first policy change would be a very simple one, and that is to stop subsidizing biomass in the renewable energy program in Massachusetts, eliminate biomass subsidies from the RPS, the Renewable Portfolio Standards, and the APS, the Alternative Portfolio Standards, instead of rolling back the RPS standards, which the Department of Energy Resources is attempting to do uh, over a lot of opposition, tremendous opposition statewide against uh, rolling back the biomass regulations. Um, so that's a policy change that could be done. There is pending legislation to accomplish that, but why do thousands of people have to fight against the administration to do the right thing? Uh, and the second policy change that I think would be very easy for you to adopt is to eliminate the management forestry program at the Department of Conservation and Recreation. That is a program that, that uh, I, I appreciate the greening, the, great, the, the gateway program where you have uh, planted 32,000 trees. That's great. I'm a big supporter of that. I help with my local uh, tree committee to plant trees here in Greenfield, Mass. Big supporter of that. It's a great program at DCR. But the management forestry program, the public lands logging program, has cut down a quarter of a million trees over the past 10 years. And we're talking about mature trees, not the tiny ones that are being planted in the Greening the Gateway program. We're talking about big, mature trees that are packing on the carbon, that are storing a lot of carbon. However, their plans over the past 10 years have been to chop down more than a million big trees on our publicly owned lands. And that's just management forestry. That doesn't include the Quabbin watershed where they have been going gangbusters, chopping down mature forests without any restrictions. And over the course of, under the management forestry program, over the course of the past 10 years, they have lost approximately $15 million of our tax money that we have paid to chop down our own forest. It is a climate crime. And that is a policy change. You could take that entire program at Management Forestry and put those folks to use planting trees in urban areas, and they would probably be a lot happier, I think. So those are my two policy changes. I, to I, I hope you take them to heart. When I mentioned them in the past, I've been told that it's very complicated and it's a balancing act, but let's get real. Those are things that could be done immediately today. They should have been done yesterday. And I hope that you will listen to what the people are saying so that we don't have to spend battling the, the, the administration by passing legislation to do this instead. Thank you very much for taking my question. Yeah, I, I appreciate the uh, the clarity and the relative brevity of what you had to say there, and uh, appreciate both uh, things that you're saying, both around uh, biomass subsidy and management forestry. Um, uh, definitely hearing you, <laughs> and uh, the uh, in terms of the of the management forestry, I think I talked to that one briefly. Uh, the uh, as as you heard earlier, particularly in Todd's uh, presentation, there are uh, reasons why one would manage uh, forests and uh, would certainly uh, want to support forestry for the kinds of invasive species removal and a variety of other things that that were spoken to. Um, I, I would ask my colleagues if anyone wants to speak up to also let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to uh, to Michael's question. Great. So I actually have some comments and I want to start by just appreciating the opportunity. Uh, this is great. Um, so I have sort of three buckets of comments. I'll do them very quickly. Um, the first one is, you know, government often tends to operate in silos, you know, just sort of one of those things everyone gets into doing their thing. Um, stepping back from this presentation a bit, the, I see that in play here in EOEA. One, my experience, what I'm dealing, looking at, the biggest threat to our forests in the Commonwealth is actually climate related, which is industrial solar development. So um, I live in Shutesbury, so just west of the Quabbin. We have one industrial solar project. We have five more that are planned and proposed. Um, but what's seen, you know, on the one hand, everyone who is concerned about, a lot of people who are concerned about climate say we have to do everything we can. And we've been struggling to say that, as um, Todd pointed out, 
that sequestration and storage of carbon is part of the solution. Um, and what we in Western Mass, in particular Central Mass, can offer is trees. But that is exactly where the development happens because there's less people and there's undisturbed forests that are cheaper to develop. Um, and so the silo effect is that it's DOER and the SMART program that's really contributing to this. Um, so yeah, on the one hand, you're battling yourself and we're having a hard time. Um, I just as a, a follow up on that, you had mentioned zoning. Um, I've been working with, and there are now legislation both in the Senate and the House to allow municipalities to zone to protect forests, wetlands, and agriculture, things that you've articulated, um, which we are explicitly prohibited from doing in Chapter 40A, Section 3. Um, and the Supreme Judicial Court is likely going to narrow that further in a, in a current case that's before them in March. So right now, if towns want to support forestry, which is, Shutesbury has a very extensive solar bylaw that I helped write, um, we can't protect forests without getting threatened. Um, that's true for all the municipalities. So, you know, if EOEA wants to do something, looking at the OER is probably a good place to say, you know, you guys control them. So how do you do that? Um, and the last part in the carbon is the um, silo effect is in the decarbonization roadmap, page 76, there's a reference to forests will continue to grow in Massachusetts. And I know in Amherst, there's a current debate right now because someone who cares very much about climate is saying, we need to do our part and build as much solar in the forest as we can. And he's using that as a um, foundation to say, forests are gonna keep growing, so therefore we can cut down forests and build industrial solar. So I think you just have to be careful about where things pop up. Um, and you know, to Todd's point about, do we need to protect forests? Yes, those three examples make it explicitly that we're having a hard time doing that because of EOEA's own things. The other two things I just say quickly, I love the 61C. The two things I would say is you can't have a buyout. So, you know, like with the other chapters, you can, you can pay back taxes if you want to back out of development. That's what's happening in solar. People have it in chapter and then they're going to pay back the back taxes and they're going to get money for solar through the SMART program. So we're undoing that. And the other thing is that there should be a requirement for improving storage and sequestration. So having a working forest status quo is not sufficient. If you're going to get 61C money, you have to actively have some benchmarks for improving it um, because otherwise just rolling over and they're not doing the job. And the last thing I would say, I've seen no net loss pop up a lot. Senator Comfort has an extensive bill. Um, I know it has its origins in wetlands. I think it's a bad use of a term because it's prime for it, abuse. You know, And so the whole idea of storage that Todd had talked about um, I don't, you know, if you're living in Boston and you're just sort of thinking generically, you say, well, we can cut down a few acres here because we're going to plant a few acres there and you lose the storage. And I don't think people are getting the impact. So no net loss sounds very nice on the surface of we're not going to lose anything. But the reality is you do lose because you're losing storage, even though you're increasing the sequestration. So I think we have to get away from the, that no net loss and basically, and I know technically there's a prioritization where you try to, you know, prevent and then cutting down is the last step. And if you have to do it, then you do it. Um, you do the no net loss, but that gets lost. On the surface, everyone's saying it's okay if you cut down forests in Western Mass for solar because we're going to plant some saplings somewhere else. And I think that's just really, it's troubling how it gets presented and people feel it's a comfort to say no net loss and people don't get below it. So figuring out how to get beyond that conundrum is I think a challenge. Thank you, Michael. I, I especially appreciate the nuanced comments around no net loss, the terminology and what it really means and how it would apply. Uh, appreciate the constructive comments on a potential chapter 61C, uh, the buyout provision uh, that it should actually require additional carbon on the landscape. Um, uh, I was, I'm certainly aware of the state prohibition on zoning, truly zoning for agriculture and forestry and uh, what a tool that would mean if possible in Massachusetts as it is in other states in the country. And then uh, finally, the uh, solar and the SMART program, uh, that is something that the executive office as a whole, not just DOER has been working on and struggling with. I wouldn't, I, I shouldn't use that term, but I think we're still working to, to get that 
uh, exactly right. Uh, we do want to encourage uh, solar development, certainly renewable energy preferred to fossil fuel based. We need to eliminate fossil fuel based. Uh, and I think we're still working to get our incentives correct around how exactly where and how we encourage uh, solar. And I think for today, I will, uh, I will leave it at that. I guess, oh, one more thing. Um, uh, there is a study getting underway commissioned by DOER, and I recognize what you said about DOER, but nonetheless, looking at uh, opportunities and siting for solar. And uh, Han, if you wanted to say anything more about that, this would be a good opportunity to offer any particulars on that one. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question, Kurt? Oh, it was. Oh. Uh, no, <laughs> sorry. I it think, was, uh, yeah, I think, uh, Todd, I think. Uh was asking for me to to jump in on the solar study oh, that gotcha. yes you know, correct on <laughs> todd sounds very similar <laughs> um so yes doer uh, we are working folks at ea is working really closely with doer on the scope of the solar potential study uh, we put in the interim 2030 plan that doer should embark will embark on a study to look at comprehensively where solar should be cited um and so um i've you know, working closely with Eric Stelzer on the scope of that, we are um, factoring in the scope of work analysis, uh, life cycle analysis, as well as um, environmental impacts and cost impacts of different siting of solar. Um, certainly, we do want to make sure that we don't put ourselves in a um, in a corner in terms of like uh, removing carbon sequestration from the forest. Um, but we also have to keep in mind that the roadmap study says that we have to have a threefold increase in solar energy, as well as um, a similar, if not more, increase in offshore wind to support the amount of um, clean energy needs that we will be needing. And so we are factoring all that in uh, into the analysis, as well as the siting of it um, and the environmental impact. So by the end of this calendar year, or early next year, the study will be complete. It will have a stakeholder process, um, which will involve an advisory committee um, and then um, public meetings um, as needed. So we, we can provide more information um, on that study once it gets going. DOR is in the process of procuring consultants. Great. So I just got one quick thing I'll just say, and then I'll shut up, Kurt. Just in terms of that, Todd had mentioned one of the dangers of fra is fragmentation, and that's exactly the problem. That is that the, the solar development is based on landowners being able to lease out the money and then corporate entities coming in to get the, the subsidies. So there is not a regional overarching approach. It's basically, does a landowner have land and can they do it? And so it's a patchwork solution that is not strategic at all in terms of where the siting is. And that's part of the problem, both on a municipal level and for the Commonwealth. And I'll send in some other comments, but thank you for the time. Yeah, I appreciate that. Todd, did you want to add anything? Otherwise, I'm going to move on to question or comment from Gian Neswald. Nope. Thanks for the opportunity, but go ahead and move on. Okay, great. Uh, Gia? Hi, thank you for this opportunity. I'm appreciating the dynamic conversation here. Um, and uh, I have some questions for Peter Church. We're looking at another landscape designation sort of process. I'm wondering um, what the invitation will be to general the general public for participation as stakeholders in our public forest lands. And um, I would also uh, love to hear whether DCR has updated its best management uh, guidelines manual. As far as I know, it was last uh, uh, revised in 2013, right after the landscape, after the forest futures process. And those guidelines contain the word carbon only once, and that's in its introductory paragraph. So if it is true that carbon stock increase and sequestration increase is a priority, why would that not be reflected in our best management practices that uh, yeah, are talked about all the time? So those are questions for Peter Church. And I have questions for Todd about um, the mention in your presentation of Wooly Ad, uh, Adelgid, I'm, I may be pronouncing it wrong. I read it not 
hear it much. Um, as well as the the um, the general um, reference to forty percent of forest lands in the U.S. being at risk of uh, destruction to beetles. Why are you talking about the U.S. figures, which are so much different from Massachusetts? There. And my question about the woolly adelgid specifically is. Why are you addressing that only in terms of thinning versus use of biological remedies, which there are silver flies and two varieties of a beetle whose name is not coming to me right now that have been employed in New York State with some success in the Adirondacks. Thank right. you. So yeah, uh, why don't we start then with Pete and uh, uh, <laughs> speak a bit to the to. Uh, DCR's landscape designations and process, the issues raised by Gia on that topic, and then Todd will turn to you about uh, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Uh, thanks, Kurt. Um, thank you, Gia. Um, so when we convene the working group, um, one of the things we'll be discussing is uh, what the public process will look like, whether um, it'll be a series of listening sessions, um, uh, potentially some field um, walks and then opportunities for public comment. And, um, and it will be looking at um, landscape designations, um, where we've been, um, how it's been working and um, getting input from the public. Um, the best management practices manual is based out of our uh, Forest Cutting Practices Act um, regulations and um, it gets updated periodically. And um, you are correct, it was last done in uh, 2013. Um, just one other note before I turn it over to Todd, um, our forest health program um, within DCR um, does um, look at um, Hemlock Willie Adulgid within our Hemlock forests. Um, we have been working with the Forest Service on biological controls. Uh, the Laracobius beetle is, um, that biological control. Um, one of the things that we do look at is um, whether uh, we still see those beetles after release. So a year after release, are they still in the forest? Um, we've had mixed success. Occasionally we've seen them again, um, but um, we're still working on it. So, um, so that's what we're doing in Massachusetts. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Todd. Great, thanks. Yeah, and good to hear the update on the biological control agents. It's, some, it's, a, it's a topic that I haven't followed as clearly, I will admit, uh, as others. But, you know, just, just to um, emphasize that, you know, uh, as Kurt mentioned, as I mentioned, you know, this, this really is about having a menu of options, having a variety of choices. And so, you know, the thin example is one example. Um, and, and as I, I had a, a kind of a snapshot of a, of a published paper that um, showed some really positive results in terms of uh, resistance to the hemlock woolly adelgid when thinning does occur in the, mm -hmm. in the remaining trees. Um, and so that's one option, but that's not to say that it's the only one. And so if there, has, if there is success with other approaches such as biological control agents, those certainly should be included as, as um, additional options to address that because, because that, is, that insect is a very destructive insect um, near 100% mortality when stands are infested, although that mortality takes years to, to play out. Um, and so things that we can do to really enhance the, the ability of those forests to continue to be carbon sinks is important. Um, now, getting to your question about that 40%, uh, that paper that, you know, addresses 40% across the U.S., I put it up there just as an example to show how important forest pests are. I recognize that, you know, we're talking about Massachusetts, and that was a, um, a paper that looked at the, con uh, at, at the lower 48, essentially, and, and that isn't necessarily representative of, of Massachusetts. So I, I do recognize that the data would probably look different if we, it existed for Massachusetts, but it doesn't. Uh, there has not been any analyses that I know of of what the potential loss of carbon from insect pests in Massachusetts is. So um, 
it, it was just again to to emphasize the point that um, there is real real risk from insect pests and you know things like hemlock woolly adelgid given that a lot of our forests have really mature uh, large diameter hemlocks that exist in them they're an important part of the carbon storage uh, in our forests we don't want to lose those and we have riparian zones that are nearly pure hemlock that when uh, if that insect gets in there, uh, we stand to, to see near complete mortality without some kind of management intervention. So uh, it's just an important consideration and, and one of many insect pests that, you know, forest health experts are really, you know, looking at what are the management options for. Um, but doing nothing is not going to be a, a management option that's going to, to play out to uh, work in our favor terms of climate mitigation. I think that's something that is sort of the take home message there. All right. Uh, thank you, Todd. Let me uh, turn next in this order to Janet Sinclair, Annie Hayes, and Dickon Crane. So uh, Janet, please uh, uh, question, comment. Uh, you have the floor. OK, great. Thanks. Um, I guess I'm um, just looking at this. Um, one of the comments that was just made about the variety of choices about how to think about our forests. Um, listening to your comments today, I'm not sure I heard this part, but <clears throat> both in the 30 by 30 idea and also chapter 61C, um, I'm not hearing anything about the value of forever wild forests. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> perhaps you've talked about that, but um, I have land and chapter 61B, I'd rather have a bigger tax break for doing what I'd like to do, which is leaving my property to, to wildlife. I, have a very um, ecologically rich area that used to be on Biomap One as a one of the special places, you know. Um, so I don't log my land, and uh, but I pay a lot of taxes for doing that, and I don't have a way of really transferring my property to someone else with a forever wild easement without paying for it myself. So anyway, we, we, this is an option that I wish that would be talked about more and appreciated more. Um, with the 30 by 30 idea, um, of course, you know, we have bills submitted to the legislature asking for more protection, uh, specifically in our wildlife management areas. That's actually called 30 by 30. Um, but in the 30 by 30 um, idea, um, some of what's being asked for worldwide is this highest level of protection. It doesn't include forest management. It's not including this kind of working landscapes idea, which I feel like is mostly what you're talking about here. You know, we should be able to not be working our landscapes. Um, it's very, there's a lot of um, scientific um, questions about, you know, um, management um, versus non-management in terms of um, carb, the carbon balance. Even DCR has shown us slides at presentations that show that leaving, um, leaving these trees alone is actually better for the carbon balance than cutting them. There are questions about whether or not you should preemptively be cutting ash trees like in our reserves. I think, I don't even know if they got cut, but it was an 8,000 acre project that was proposed a little while ago. So, so what I'm trying to say here is that, is that there's questions about the science that was presented by the scientists today. Um, I feel like we should be entertaining more than one point of view. Um, and also I, I would like to say uh, reiterating the solar idea, we're really watching um, these developers, you know, mow down our effort to protect our forests. I'm very concerned about my town of Buckland. We have these bylaws that were, were made to protect our forests. And now we're watching um, these um, developers actually threaten to sue our towns if we enforce our own bylaws. I think that that should be a, a grave concern to all of you if you are caring about um, um, trying to reduce our, our loss of uh, forested areas. Oh, by the way, the other thing I want to say, there's a lot of great questions over in the chat and people aren't like, um, I don't know why people aren't like signing up to talk to you. They're not, I guess people are shy, but I hope that you answer some of those great questions that are in the chat. Uh, appreciate your pointing that out. And just uh, let me I'm start with a couple of things and then invite my colleagues to add other things. Uh, so uh, I, I think what I one of the items you brought up, I believe, was an, it sounds like an option for a, a chapter 61 version that essentially is 
more passive management beside, and not an, a, a requirement to cut actively under chapter 61. So I think that was one aspect of what you brought up. And I, I think broadly speaking, it sounds like a, uh, a recognition of the importance of just reserves uh, and uh, that approach. Um, uh, solar, I think we've talked about a bit. I do hear, hear you emphasizing the particular uh, concern about solar. Um, the municipal zoning on solar, uh, we could talk a bit about that. I think there is opportunity for municipalities to use zoning to direct solar to different locations, but under the, the zoning uh, exemption under 48.3, they're, they're an absolute prohibition, as you probably know, not, not doable. But still, you, the, a municipality like Buckland ought to be able to condition uh, to some degree where it would prefer to see solar as opposed to, um, anyway, let me stop there and ask my, some of my colleagues who brought up things that maybe Pete or Todd or Jessica would like to, uh, to address. Or not. <laughs> um, Janet, you're muted, I'm afraid. Um, no, I know. Can I say one more little thing and I'll stop? <laughs> yes, okay. and I'll turn to Annie next. <laughs> okay. Well, Pete, Pete um, Church knows this. So one of the things in terms of just this kind of, you know, worldwide 30 by 30 idea or, you know, the value of, uh, of reserves, which I, I hope we all recognize, um, we do have bills submitted to the legislature that reflect this, what I really believe is the public sentiment about this, which is that we would like these reserves to be made permanent and including both the wildlife management areas and also the DCR properties. And the reason why is because we just watched a DOER totally backtrack on um, the, um, the renewable portfolio standard for, for biomass. It was done by a regulation rather than by a law. And we watched a new governor come in. We worked so hard on getting our RPS regulations 10 years ago, then we watched the governor insert a person into DOER who just decided to just throw all of our hard work away. And now we're trying to get legislation. And so when we look at these reserves, we, we the public, I'm saying the public, and I, and I mean, I think I understand what the public wants because I've been talking so much to people, is that, is that unless these reserves are made permanent or the, this whole landscape designation process is made a permanent part of DCR, that the next, then, you know, when, when a different bunch of people comes in and works for DCR or a different, you know, governor or whatever, it could all be tossed out. So we would like this to be um, really, um, we would like some sense of security about, about the reserves that we have now. So. Thank you, Janet. I appreciate the desire to make it uh, permanent. And in order to get other folks on here, I think I'm going to move on to Annie Hayes and what you might have to say, Annie. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I want to uh, talk about what it's like to have a small 17 acre old farm that has about, um, I don't know, 15 acres of forest on it. Um, I spend a lot of time unwinding invasives from saplings and older trees, and it's almost a full time job. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not enough. And I see so many trees being snapped up at their um, newer branches and, and then die. And recently I went down 95 to New Jersey and I saw the same thing in even the most wealthy uh, communities on the Merritt Parkway. So between the invasives, the developers, right behind me is a 44-acre um, uh, land that, and I hate the word parcel, it's living earth and it's a right beside on the ridge, the land trust, and then I'm at the back and all the people who observe the land, which is not the landowners, can see that it's the highest point of our town. The, the watershed goes down to numerous rivers, ponds, waterways, streams, rivulets. It evolved with all of the waterways after the glacier receded, owned by a couple of guys who are um, going to clear cut it and put in solars on a slope. And my, you know, let me just finish. So the climate, the insects, the invasives, the developers, the solar developers, um, the, the house developers, the solar developers, and the pilots that uh, towns get to compensate for this disaster. 
um, all of this leaves the citizenry broken hearted, sick, going to planning boards where unless the proponent is there, we cannot speak. And the people I talked to when we were taking signatures for a change in the solar bylaw, et cetera, hate solar. And this is not good for the resilience that we need to build. I think that education is the key. And boy, I talked to a lot of people trying to do that, but it, it needs to be on a state level. And I think one of the things that you could do would to be to write a very well thought out document for planning boards in towns across the state. There are different kinds of environments I know, but we are all at the planning boards grappling with, oh, we can't do that or we're gonna be sued. And um, I don't see any need for that. I think the, um, the conservation effort and the bylaws or the um, you know, development of renewables, I don't call them green energy right now because they're destroying green for solar. Um, they have to dovetail, you have to work together. Another thought is to have in communities working conservation areas where people are hired who know what they're doing. I have all this, this forest, I see the trees go down from the winds, from um, more rains that you know stay a, a pool around the base of the tree, all of this, and there's, no, there's not even an arborist in our town because apparently we can't afford it. I don't think that's so different from a lot of places. We watch the old pine barrens being cut down for sand mining. I mean, it's just, I hate even talking about it because my heart starts pounding. And um, I'm an older person. My goal is to do whatever I can to help so that future generations are not staring into a virtual reality of what a forest is, or they don't even care what a forest is uh, because they've seen it as roadkill for so long. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hear some passion uh, and frustration. A little passion. <laughs> and, uh, you need to hear it. <laughs> some of the things you uh, you brought up, uh, you you referenced uh, basically what I would call technical assistance guidance. I earlier in my part of the presentation mentioned uh, several zoning techniques, but I think you're basically bringing up the idea that that municipal planning boards and others could just use good information uh, on their, their capabilities, what they can do under state statute and what their uh, their authority is. I hear that, that part of uh, what you're arguing. I think also hearing just expertise to deal with the uh, conditions on the ground in regard to forestry, uh, that there just isn't the expertise available to do this uh, at the municipal level. Cre uh, uh, correct, and modeling. Modeling that teaches people how to carry on. It's not just an expert coming in, you know, being there for a bit and leaving. It's modeling so people are educated in how to to be stewards of their own, even e on their own yard, and not cut trees down because they become, uh, you know, trees become expendable and trees are going to hit their house when the wind blows. You know, how to, how to protect and conserve. Um, uh, colleagues, uh, Todd, anyone else want to uh, chime in here? Otherwise, I'll turn to Dick and Crane and then JF after Dick and I. All right. Thank you, Annie. Appreciate uh, your, your passion around these issues. Uh, Dick and Crane and then JF. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> I really appreciate the comments on the importance of education. I think that. Uh, um, Programs like this are really helpful where people who have uh, been researching forests and uh, climate um, and, and how they affect each other. And then of course us humans, how we affect both. Uh, but getting to a, a real understanding of this relationship, uh, I think is critically important to making the right kind of decisions. And, that it's most important that the public recognize this and recognize how their understanding of this relationship between humans, forests, and the climate is what's going to lead the uh, policies and uh, regulations that are gonna make a difference. And uh, so understanding that, having 
opportunities to uh, see the research put in uh, an accessible way, I think is what DCR and um, EEA and everyone who can do it should be doing uh, because uh, the public is, you know, very easily uh, swayed in one way or another uh, without fully understanding what those impacts are. And uh, so that uh, these educational opportunities, um, I think, need to be, you know, pursued and that the research so that what we're, you know, having the opportunity to learn is based on good research. That research has to be supported and money needs to be spent to get that research done. I don't think we're anywhere near, uh, nearly uh, have, have done enough research that even the researchers are comfortable that they fully understand these relationships and they are you know, critical. But I, I agree that the do nothing approach is um, probably a really bad idea, but that means doing something, we have to be doing the right something. And, uh, and I think there's a lot to be learned to figure out what that is. Um, but just saying that doing nothing is uh, gonna solve the problem. I don't think very many problems have actually been solved that way. Uh, the, um, so basically, I guess really where I'm going is we need to get the public brought up to uh, an understanding of what's really, uh, what really the relationship is and that, you know, we as humans are, uh, you know, a factor that we, uh, we have to accept that we can't make this planet like it would be if we weren't here, uh, of course, unless we go away. Um, but that our impacts are as critical as, um, you know, the, our relationship with forests. I mean, we're just, we just can't uh, act as though we're not here in a forest. We'll just turn back into what it would have been had we not come along. Um, so we need to be smart. And, um, and I think this is a good way to, to get there. Uh, so let's, let's have more of this. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Dick. And I think as we'll, as we'll talk about in the end, we are intending uh, additional public sessions like this one coming up, one in uh, February, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but broadly speaking, uh, I hear a call for good information and educated public and support from the Commonwealth for science and in particular for making that science accessible. I, I, do, I did hear earlier the comment about we need multiple uh, perspectives on science and not, not just a single source given the uh, information that we need. Uh, so appreciate the comments, Dick, and I, I guess maybe I, we do have a, a particular a scientist, a doctor, Dr. Ampel on the, on the uh, panel here today, and maybe he might have a few words on this, and, uh, and then I'd invite other colleagues. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. I, I, I am in full agreement that, you know, the, the, the communication of the science, the, the translation of the science into kind of an understandable format for, for non-scientists is, is, is critical. Um, you know, there's, there's very passionate opinions about this topic um, as, as, we, as we fully recognize. And, um, and having forum for discussion and having the um, educational resources to, to really kind of consider uh, sort of fully what are the, the, the various options and um, what's the science behind it is particularly important. And, and so, you know, we are as sort of a community of scientists focused on, on outreach and education for both land management professionals and landowners, you know, working to address the need here. And, and so, you know, some of those resources that I put up at the final slide are, are some of those resources we have put out recently to address that need, but we are not calling it 
good and and moving on here there's a lot of work to be done and and we are um, certainly focusing on making sure that we are are addressing that need on information so i i hear you and and i do agree yeah this this would be a good juncture for me to mention that uh, has as i think has come up in the chat yes this slides and information will be available uh to folks so that um you can uh, can access those documents that Todd just mentioned, as well as, as just look through the uh, the slides and content at more leisure. <laughs> um, uh, let's see here, JF. I believe you're up next. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> science and education is very important, but I know one thing: what's happening in southeastern Massachusetts, you don't need you don't really need it. Then understand that the sighting is that's taken place for these solar arrays is wrong um, in a lot of cases. I think we all agree in green energy. Um, everyone on this phone is probably pretty in tune with what's going on in the world, but the sighting in Southeastern Massachusetts is borderline catastrophe. It's very short sighted. Um, I grew up in this area. I'm seeing some of the last largest expanses of forest, globally rare forest, found nowhere else on earth, disappearing and as you can tell, it, it gets my heart pumping. Um, it's an oversight, guys. We have to fix it. We want green energy. We want solar. But we cannot destroy priority habitats where generations have grown up um, for, for this short-sighted industrial endeavors. We want green energy, but we have to do it the right way. So hopefully we can continue to work on this and, and get in touch with it. Thank you. Uh, uh, JF, I appreciate that, emphasizing the concern about solar that we've heard from several uh, several other speakers today. Um, I realize this is not an, an imperfect answer, and I, I, it does not fully address what you're raising. However, I believe the condition, the smart program regulations do not allow for a subsidy on what on biomap uh, lands, if you know what biomap is. That, that, that is not the same thing as forested land or dealing with the forest blocks. There, there are forest blocks that are not biomap habitat, uh, but there, there was an effort in the la latest iteration of SMART to at least address uh, biomap habitat in that way. Um, and so, but I, I hear you that uh, echoing what we heard from others that the, this, this, the solar is a concern and an ongoing problem. And also just to let you know, just because it's biomap designated does not mean it's ecologically valuable to the region too. You know, so we got to keep that, you know, just because it says it on the map, there's going to, there could be constant involve, involve, you know, monitoring to keep determining, you know, the integrity of things that haven't been mapped. So just an FYI. <laughs> great, great. Uh, Gia, I do recognize that you have your hand up again. I'm going to call on a couple of other folks that haven't spoken yet first, and I'll come back to you uh, as time allows. But I do want to want to turn to um, a, a couple of other folks. Um, so to begin with, and I'm afraid... I know where you're coming from, and I can guess you echo the perspective about uh, solar in the Southeast, but uh, maybe you could introduce yourself uh, uh, and speak to uh, Saving the Pine Barrens. Sure, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Meg Sheehan. Um, I have been a public interest lawyer here in Massachusetts for over 35 years, worked in all parts of the state. I worked on the biomass um, campaign in 2010, trying to prevent the clear cutting of our forests for biomass burning incinerators. I've been working on the solar siting issue since 2016, when an area of critical environmental concern was stripped for uh, solar with only a building permit from the town of Plymouth. Um, the solar siting regulations um, are not regulations at all, they're guidelines. The SMART program has not prevented the clear cutting and denuding of priority habitat in Southeastern Mass and other parts of the states, Shirley, Belchertown, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we are losing a huge opportunity to um, acquire conservation lands um, at, in Southeastern Mass. Much of the land here is owned by one large landowner, A.D. Makepeace. They have that land in chapter 61A they call it agricultural land or forestry land. It's actually not either. The 61A lands are being converted into solar at an alarming rate. The right of first refusal is being given to the towns. The land is not being used for agriculture. The, the, instead of the state coming in 
and buying that land or helping the towns to understand that 61A right of first refusal can be taken advantage of to protect that land. It's um, up to local communities and I can't tell you how many hundreds, perhaps, th perhaps thousands of acres of 61A land has been converted into solar here with not so much as a blink on the part of local officials. In terms of where you should be spending your conservation funds, so you should mm -hmm. be spending them there. You should be out in front of this. This is a farce. This uh, ex the existence of these 61A lands in a lot of situations because again they're classified as agricultural, but they're not being used for agriculture. They're being used for industrial solar and for strip mining. Um, you can look at some GIS maps that we have on our website to see that. Um, these tools that you've been talking about, as I mentioned in the chat, they're great, but unless you have a sustained educational effort in local communities, they're pretty much useless, as are the bylaws that are violated and ignored on, at every turn. Again, endless lawsuits over that. Um, we, Save the Pine Barrens, did a webinar on community planning for conservation in Southeastern Mass with Mass Audubon several months ago. My question is, why is this being left up to small groups like ours, um, you know, a small grassroots group trying to educate our towns on how our existing zoning laws can be used to protect forests for climate? Again, you need to have a sustained investment in our communities. Um, and we should not be ignoring the fact that forever wild philosophies about managing our forests um, or not managing our forests and hands off are really the best way to um, sustain the biodiversity that we need. And it shouldn't, this climate plan shouldn't be just about trying to replace, you know, or save some um, carbon for purposes of the roadmap, which in our view is a large farce, I would still like to see somebody dis describe what net zero is, but the biodiversity and the climate resiliency of the forest has to be taken into account too. So those are just some of our concerns. We are continuing to advocate in every forum, including with the legislature, trying to prevent uh, the um, cranberry industry and others from getting even more subsidies and trying to be able to keep their land in agricultural use while getting subsidies for solar and putting solar on those projects, on those sites, trying to prevent the rollback taxes when they convert to solar. Just a few of our issues and would love to have a meeting with you to go into more detail. Okay. Um, so I just recapping very briefly, I hear uh, concerns about how chapter 61 and 61 I are working or not working. Um, I hear invest in Southeast Mass. I hear a desire for a broader conversation than we're gonna be able to have today about this topic and just general concern about solar siting in, in, in the Pine Barrens in this case, but more broadly. Um, and uh, Han, I know we're coming at, to the end of time here. Uh, I was hoping to take at least one more person before we run out. Do you have something you want? Go ahead, Han. Uh, yes, please. Um, let's see one more person. I do have um, a person by the name of Mike Langard who emailed um, a statement and question and asked that I um, speak for him. So uh, yes, you did mention this. Go, go ahead and then I'll take uh, one more person and then we'll, we'll wrap up. All right. Um, it was on my computer and then now it's... <laughs> Perhaps you could take the next person. I'm. It was All right. on, I know it's gone. All right, we'll come back to Han in a moment. Uh, let me take what sounds like a law firm, Mikhail and Papillardo. <laughs> uh. uh, hello, my name is Nancy Mikhail. Um, we are not a um, a law firm. I, I, we are <laughs> private citizens. Thank you yes, very I'm much. Sure. <laughs> I I am currently um, sitting and the, as the chair of the Wareham Solar Bylaw Rewrite Committee. Mm. Um, and it is unbelievably difficult trying to balance um, all of this. Our forests have been devastated by 19 large scale solar farms, um, close to 300, maybe even 400 acres at this point have mm. been um, clear cut. So I would just like to make a couple of comments. 
that there needs to be a huge increase in the funding for protection of the uplands for our water quality. We are on the coast. We are at extreme um, danger of sea level rise because of so many areas that are, will be inundated with, with even a foot or two foot feet of sea level rise. Um, so I would encourage that. We need to protect uh, the very special ecosystems, not just the hardwood forest, because um, as several people have mentioned, the pine barrens are globally rare. They don't necessarily look like much when you walk through them, but they are full of life and biodiversity. We need to protect those as well. So don't count those out, please. Um, the local zoning boards are hamstrung by 40A, section three. So that needs to be addressed. That has become the 40B of the ecology of the ecosystems. Um, subsidies for forests in, for subsidies for solar and forests needs to end and subsidies need to only be applicable if they're in already um, developed areas, brownfields, um, over parking lots, over gravel pits, those sorts of things. So that's a huge thing. And, but my last point is that we need to recognize that Massachusetts is not in the Sun Belt. What are we trying to do focusing everything on solar? We need to look for newer technologies. We need to protect what we have, which is the forest and our biodiversity, because once they're gone, they are gone. Thank you very much. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity to speak. In, in interest of time, I take all of that under advisement that my colleagues do um, and would ask folks as we run out of time here, we are taking written comment. We will, of course, look at everything that's been posted to the chat. And let me turn then to Han and then we'll offer some wrap up comments after Han. Thank you, Kurt. So um, yes, this comment is for Mike Leonard. Over 70% of Massachusetts forests have been degraded or at risk of significant decline by many insects and diseases, as well as other agents, including destructive storms. According to the latest US Forest Inventory Report for Massachusetts, tree mortality is now almost 50% of annual forest growth. As a result, our forests are increasing, are releasing more than 4 million tons of carbon every year as more trees decline and die, reducing net growth and decreasing carbon sequestration rates. This is equivalent to the annual CO2 emissions from 870,000 cars. In addition, estimated methane emission rate from our declining forest is equivalent to burning 16 gallons of gas per acre per year or equivalent to as much as 50 million gallons of gas each year. Supporting low-grade timber markets so that foresters can improve our forests is the best way to reduce those emissions. What are you doing? What are you going to do to support low-grade timber markets so that foresters can practice superior forestry and greatly reduce emissions while improving our forests? Again, this is Mike Leonard from yeah, Norris Wagon Forestry. Thanks on uh, comment submitted in advance from someone unable to attend today. So, so thank you. Um, all right, so um, oops. let me turn then to, uh, to this slide and, and to wrapping up as a reminder, uh, this is the second we have uh, a series of conversations. We are going to look to continue uh, this conversation on February 11th, uh, again from noon. Uh, to two, feedback on additional options for greenhouse gas emissions and reducing carbon sequestration. Uh, I want to thank Todd, uh, Jessica, and Pete for joining me today in this panel, uh, as well as all my colleagues, and especially the public, all of you for, uh, we just had about an hour long conversation and suggestions from everyone, and I really appreciate, um, I, I hear the passion and hear the, uh, the concern about uh, how we address these topics. Um, Han, uh, anything else to add as we as we wrap up here? Um, no. Um, if anyone who has been joining this meeting but is not already on the signed up list, um, please go to mass.gov forward slash 2030 CCP. There is a sign up list there um, to get more meeting notice for the upcoming meeting. Otherwise, um, that's it. Thank you, Kurt.
Thank you, yeah. everyone. Uh, uh, Todd or any other panelists uh, want to say anything as we conclude here? Otherwise, I would just say again, thank you. Just reiterate the thank you for your attendance and your and your comments. We appreciate them. All right. Um, take care, everyone. Appreciate your time.